Good morning and welcome to the 25th meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure they are turned to silent. Uh, we have received apologies today from Jamie Green, MSP. Our first item of business today is an evidence session on the Article 50 negotiations uh, with Professor Anand Menon, Director of the ESRC UK in a Changing Europe programme. Uh, Professor Menon uh, has indicated that he would like to make a short opening statement. Professor Menon. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I think all I'll do is briefly summarise what I put in the written submission I gave to you. Uh, I mean, some of the questions I was asked to answer are unanswerable. Uh, what is the current stay of, state of play in the Article 50 negotiations, perhaps? It's very, very hard to say. I mean, what is obviously clear is that the big issue on the table at the moment is the Northern Ireland backstop. What is equally clear is that the issue that has got Westminster in a frenzy is checkers even though actually Chequers isn't going to be part of any legally binding agreement that we come out with after the Article 50 process. So there's a curious disjuncture between the sort of attention of Westminster and the focus of the talks at the moment, because the EU are adamant that this is about the past, not the future. Uh, and there is a long, long way to go. I mean, one of the most remarkable things about the Article 50 process is we're so deep into it, and it is impossible to know where it's going to end up. I mean, you can trace a logical and relatively convincing path from where we are now to any conceivable outcome, whether that is no deal, whether that is another referendum, or whether that is some sort of patched up vague deal at the end of the process. And the key milestones for me are going to be, firstly, obviously, the October and potentially November summits. It is conceivable the process at EU level won't end there. It is perfectly conceivable we end up with another special summit after November in the event that, that we don't end up with a deal. And it's worth bearing in mind that you know, there are lots of different deadlines in the Article 50 process. For some people, the deadline is Christmas, because Christmas is when firms are going to trigger contingency plans if there's no certainty about the future. But in political terms, we could sort out the deal with the European Union in January and still have time for the process to, to wend its way through till the end of March. And then looking at the domestic level, the key milestones are not only the vote on the deal, because Westminster gets to vote on the deal that comes back, but then remember that Westminster also has to vote on the bill that puts that deal into law. Uh, and I would just point out that historical precedent suggests that members of parliament will not always vote the same way in the first vote as they do in the second. If you go back to 1973, when we joined the European communities, there was a big majority for the, the agreement to join, and a majority of only nine for the European Communities Act. So when MPs see the detail of the legislation that puts in place the agreement that they've signed with the European Union, they might change their mind. So they effectively have two bites at the cherry and two opportunities to veto the deal. Uh, and we're not entirely sure when that second deal will be held. In terms of impacts, clearly, A, leaving the single market in the customs union will have a pro profound impact on our economy. There's no point in trying to deny that. B, those impacts are going to vary considerably uh, regionally. Uh, ironically, if you look simply in terms of trade interdependence, then the two parts of the United Kingdom that are least exposed to trade with the U European Union are Scotland and London. And I say ironically because, of course, they're the two parts of the country that most had voted most strongly to remain. Uh, we have a, a research team that I'm happy to point you towards their website who do a detailed tracking of what they expect regional impacts to be, and they're in a far better position to talk about the detailed economics than I. The final question I tried to address was the issue of whether or not it is conceivable that we will remain in the single market or that Scotland will, and I'll just point you to two things that we say in the written evidence. Firstly, whilst the European Union is clearly willing to consider a unique deal for Northern Ireland, I think that absolutely does not mean they will be willing to do the same for Scotland. The reason they are showing flexibility over Northern Ireland, despite, I should say, grave disquiet about that special deal on the part of some member states, is because the Republic of Ireland are insisting on it. Uh, that will not apply to the same extent to Scotland. The second thing I would say is Whatever flexibility the current government might show in negotiations with the European Union, I cannot conceive of that extending to anything remotely like single market membership because that brings into play the fundamental three red lines. 
And I'll leave it there, Madam Chair, if that's okay. Thank you very much. And thank you very much also for the, your written evidence as well, which was very useful. Um, in, in that written evidence, you suggest that a compromise is possible on the backstop uh, to facilitate the completion of the overall withdrawal agreement. And, and yet, statements that we've heard from key people in, in Europe, um, such as um, uh, Giver Hofstadt when his tweets this morning, uh, and also the convener of the European Parliament's uh, Constitution uh, Committee, have, Danuta Hubner, uh, have suggested that um, the proposed checkers deal, even if there was a Northern Ireland backstop worked out, uh, would still not be acceptable because it, it violates the single market, it violates the four principles of the single market. So even if a backstop was uh, somehow agreed, is there any guarantee, given everything that's happened, given Salzburg, that uh, the checkers plan could get through because it divides the single market um, in the sense that it it wants to be in the single market for goods but not for services and of course it doesn't sign up to free movement of people. Well, I mean, there are two separate, firstly on Guy Verhofstadt himself, uh, clearly it is worth bearing in mind that the parliament does have the vote on this. Uh, there's some slight confusion over this because he also tweeted yesterday that we will not vote in favour of an extension to Article 50 and the European Parliament doesn't get a vote on that so uh, that's slightly misleading but on the terms of the deal itself the European Parliament does. But I'd separate two things. There's the backstop and there's checkers. Uh, checkers, for me, is an attempt to ensure that implementation of a backstop doesn't lead to regulatory checks within the United Kingdom. Uh, and you're absolutely right. The European Union has addressed all sorts of concerns about the backstop. Uh, my personal view is the European Union has a tendency to address interest as principle. Uh, in the sense that there are several instances where the European Union has, a, has, has waived its principles. If you could think about the association agreement with Ukraine, you could think about the deal with Switzerland, or you could think about the deal on offer to Northern Ireland. And in all those instances, the integrity of the four freedoms is somewhat mitigated. Okay? What they are saying, though, is they will not do that for the United Kingdom as a whole, which is fair enough. There are good economic reasons uh, not to do that. So I don't think checkers as it is will fly. Uh, I still remain cautiously optimistic that between them, the British government and the European Union will find a way of preventing the border in the island of Ireland whilst reducing as far as possible the visibility and the impact of checks across the Irish Sea. I mean, I think that's ultimately where a solution... There will have to be some sort of differentiation, I think, between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom because of the European Union's insistence that either we all remain in the single market or there will have to be checks. Right. Um, in your written evidence, you set up a, a timeline to the end of March... When do you think the withdrawal agreement needs to be negotiated by so that it can ensure full implementation? Uh, I would say by about mid to late January, they need to sign it off in the European Council to go to the European Parliament to be safe, to be done by the 29th of March. I mean, there are two ultimate deadlines. There's the 29th of March, which is a political deadline here. I find it very, very hard to see how this government under this Prime Minister politically will be able to extend that deadline because I think they've made great play of stressing that date. The ultimate practical deadline beyond which Brexit gets delayed quite significantly is the end of April because that is the last plenary sitting of the European Parliament after which they break up for elections and then nothing is going to happen again till the autumn. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll move now to Ke Kenneth Gibson, MSP. Yes, uh, thank you uh, very much, convener. Uh, the negotiated transition period as part of the withdrawal agreement is scheduled to end in December 2020. Uh, but obviously it's going to be extremely um, challenging to negotiate uh, uh, and finalise future relationship within those 21 months after the UK has left the EU. Is there a need to include uh, provision in the withdrawal agreement for an extension? Uh, to the transition period, uh, as argued by uh, Fabian Zulik and Tobias Locke? Well, two things. Firstly, it won't be a 21-month negotiation, because if you think about it, from the end of March until probably the start of autumn, there will be little in the way of negotiations, because we'll be appointing a new European Commission. 
and therefore a new trade commissioner, and we'll have the European Parliament elections. And, of course, it takes anything from nine to 12 months to get these things ratified, because in the European Union, trade deals have to be ratified by national parliaments, and in cases like Belgium, that we're all now all too familiar with, by regional parliaments as well. Mm -hmm. So, actually, it is far, far less than 21 months. Mm -hmm. Now, all I can do here is report the views of my EU law colleagues, and, of course, each of them has a different view, uh, but the consensus opinion seems to be that it will be necessary to have something in the withdrawal agreement that makes reference to an ability to extend the transition period. The reasoning for that is that for some people, even transition as it stands is a bit of a stretch of Article 50, because mm. Article 50 is basically about the past, not the future, and the European Council is kind of overstepping its powers by agreeing a new third-party relationship, albeit for only those 21 months, with a, with a third country. It looks like we're not going to have a legal challenge to that, so, so far, so good. Once we start transition, uh, there are some EU law experts who would argue that even if the withdrawal agreement itself contains provisions for extending transition, that is not legally foolproof, because it, it will look to some people like a usurpation of power by mm -hmm. the European Council. That is to say, the European Council deciding on an ability to lengthen a third-party agreement that formally should go through another process involving the Commission and the European Parliament. That we don't know yet, but it certainly seems to be wise to include provisions in the withdrawal agreement which will make it safer than not. I understand that um, there's already been agreement to contribute to EU data systems up to 2026. So, I mean, sh so there's already effectively been uh, agreements to go beyond the, the, the stated transition uh, period of 21 months. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, our untangling from EU uh, institutions and policies and processes is going to be staggered and will take place at different points in different times. Uh, and you're absolutely right, data is one of those areas. But that's slightly different from transition. Transition is a specific status we will enjoy with regard to the European Union, where effectively... In economic terms, we continue as we are now, just with no representation in the institutions. So that's very different to the individual yeah. sectoral deals. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Annabel Ewing. Um, thank you, uh, convener. Good morning, uh, Professor. And just picking up on a couple of points. So um, with regard to the Irish backstop issue, obviously uh, remains unresolved uh, at this stage. Um, difficult to see how it will be resolved, given the diametrically opposed views emerging. But I just wondered, in terms of the the unity or otherwise of the 27 uh, on that issue, uh, and indeed more generally, what, what would your view be that it seems, uh, in terms of the public position, that the 27 remain uh, unified on their negotiating stance uh, in terms of the EU? And, and I just wonder what your, your view on that was. Well, on this, of course, there's all sorts of rumour and counter-rumour, and there's a piece in the FT today that sort of hints at the fact that the Irish might be softening towards British proposals more than other EU member states. I don't know whether that's true or not. The EU has certainly publicly kept its unity quite impressively. I mean, there are, diff there are different shades of opinion among the member states about whether or not the EU should or should not be more flexible. I think, ultimately, all national capitals realise that it's simply not worth the hassle to engage in a full-scale fight amongst themselves, and it's far easier to leave this with the European Commission than open up what could be a damaging fight between them. One other point of division is that there are some member states that are already rather twitchy about the Northern Ireland backstop as proposed in the December agreement. Uh, I've heard people uh, close to the French government say that this raises a profound danger that Northern Ireland becomes a sort of manufacturing hub that manufacturers from the rest of the UK will relocate to Northern Ireland to benefit from the fact that Northern Ireland will be in some of the single market but not all of it and therefore will gain a comparative advantage. So there are already divisions but they're not breaking through to the political level as yet. What happens in the future we don't know. It seems clear to me that the British government is still hoping that as we reach the end point the combination of the prospect of no deal plus the increased involvement of political principles in the process, 
will lead to those divisions becoming more pronounced. The rationale is at the moment Brexit in the national capitals across the EU is handled by essentially sectoral experts who are steeped in EU law, but perhaps not so steeped in geopolitics. And that the more the heads of state and government get involved in this, the more they will recognise that there need to be trade-offs, which is why, for instance, the new foreign secretary, when he went to Berlin, soon after his appointment, was talking about the dangers to the Western alliance, if we don't get this right, appealing to the sort of broader geopolitical issues at stake rather than the, simply the technical issues of EU law. I don't know what will happen. It seems to me very, very unlikely that EU unity is going to break publicly and to our benefit before the end of this process. I mean, you, you referred there to, um, and I, I speak as a former uh, lawyer practising EU law, mostly in the private sector, um, you speak of, you know, this moving out of the realm of EU lawyers into the realm of those engaged in geopolitics. I wonder, would that apply to the, the DUP? Because their statements this week suggest that uh, the, the geopolitical situation on a wider scale is not really uh, something that is forefront uh, in their Absolutely position. Not. Absolutely not. I mean, what we have at the moment is several simultaneous games of chicken being played by different people against different people. So the British government is playing chicken with its own backbenchers. It's playing chicken with the European Union. It's playing chicken with the Irish Republic. The DUP is playing chicken with the British government. There are people in the British government who in private will say, ultimately, bless you, uh, that ultimately the DUP would rather compromise than face the risk of a Corbyn government. Uh, everyone is, is assuming that everyone else is talking tough but will soften towards the deadline. What is very interesting to me is that both in the December agreement and repeated even in the heat of battle immediately after Salzburg by the Prime Minister is that phrase, there will be no new checks between the Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom unless Stormont agrees to it. So it is still conceivable that the government behind the scenes is trying to talk to politicians in Northern Ireland saying, what will it take for you to sign this off? Well, that remains to be seen. I'm picking up one last point um, that you, you, you mentioned um, where you suggested that the in uh, other uh, examples of, of trade agreements, um, the fundamental freedoms had been somewhat mitigated. I mean, I, 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 I hear what you say, but I would put it to you nonetheless, is it not the case that, you know, if you don't have the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice as far as the four fundamental uh, freedoms are concerned, then you don't have the jurisdiction of the ECJ, which means uh, absolutely that you have a very loose form of cooperation and you don't have anything near the status quo in terms of, of freedom of movement of goods, for example, because those are the rules of the club. If you're not subject to the umpire, you don't have the same set of rules. Is that not nonetheless still the position, uh, irrespective of what their motivation in terms of matter of principle might be? The fact remains, as a matter of law, that they have very little leeway uh, to go beyond the, the structures of the, 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 the tenants, indeed, of the single market? Well, I'd say that's true with wrinkles, in the sense that, for instance, if you look at the EEA agreement, it is a way, if you want to be cynical about it, of dressing up the direct authority of the European Court of Justice. And proponents of the EEA model will say, look, you're slightly freer of the European Court of Justice. Actually, I don't think you are that much freer, because ultimately, if you look at the track record, EU law gets implemented and the European... Court of Justice has oversight. I think you're absolutely right. But there are two different issues, aren't there? There are the issues of whether or not you're within the whole of the single market or bits of it, and that there's the issue of how those bits you're in are justiciable. And I think, actually, the negotiations over governance will be absolutely fundamental, and it's something we haven't spoken about yet enough. I mean, in the government's white paper, of course, they put forward some very vague proposals on governance and how governance uh, can be managed short of direct ECJ uh, authority, but I think you're absolutely right. From the EU side, that's non-negotiable. Either you're under... I mean, that's one of the big sort of cultural differences between the two sides, where you hear the British government say things like, well, obviously our laws will be equivalent to EU law, so we don't need to bother. And from the EU side, it's like, that's all very well, but ultimately there has to be a court overseeing it, and as far as we're concerned, it's our court. So on that, you're right, yeah. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, just following on from the Annabelle Ewing's questions, uh, and notwithstanding your comment a few moments ago regarding the, uh, the different uh, players in this playing chicken with each other, have you, have you seen or are you aware of any evidence at all of uh, a semblance of common sense actually taking place uh, from an economic perspective uh, between the various... Uh, political players uh, in this to 
try to get to a, a successful outcome, particularly regarding the Northern Irish situation? Well, what is clear is that both sides are committed to not having a border on the island of Ireland. They differ in how you get there and they differ in how sacrosanct each other's principles are in terms of a final deal. What, I mean, what is curious to me about the Brexit, I mean, the Brexit process as a whole, I mean, ultimately, at its simplest level, the Brexit decision was a decision to make trade with our biggest and nearest trading partners slightly more difficult. And, you know, one of the ways I interpret the Brexit vote is it's a triumph of politics over economics. Uh, so economics driving political decisions is no longer the case in this sort of post-Brexit world. And actually, that's very, very clear if you look at the Chequers Agreement. I mean, for the Chequers, for me, is a wonderful example of politics triumphing over economics. If you're an economist and you wanted to write Chequers to ensure the best economic deal for the United Kingdom in its relations with the European Union, you'd have turned it on its head. You'd have said, we don't have to worry about agriculture because it's such an insignificant proportion of our GDP. Uh, manufacturing is relatively unimportant. We need to strike a deal on services because that ultimately is what our economy is about. Check as it <coughs> seems to me, turns that logic on its head for political reasons, uh, partly the political reason of the Northern Irish border. I .e. Checkers was written with a, with a view to avoiding a border rather than with a view to anything else. And also because of the political rather than the economic salience of sectors like manufacturing. So I don't think politics is, uh, economics is driving this process on either side. You remember back in the referendum, several spokespeople of the Leave camp were expressing their confidence that the German car makers would go and see the German Chancellor and say, look, this will be bad for business, and that therefore the German Chancellor would cave. It, I think on both sides, politics is running this show rather than economics. Okay. Um, just uh, on the issue of the, uh, Germany and other EU27 uh, nations, we have heard uh, on more than one occasion in this committee that Brexit uh, is not the burning issue uh, within the EU27. Uh, they've got many other domestic issues, and Brexit is just uh, number five or six or seven uh, down the line. Uh, do you still think uh, that's the... That's the case in the other EU27? Yeah, I, I think that probably is the case, uh, certainly in the short term, uh, which is one of the reasons why the British government is trying to say, well, look, if you look beyond the actual exit date, this is going to have all sorts of spillover effects on security, cooperation and other things that you need to think about. But no, day to day in the European capitals, they're worrying about uh, the migration crisis. They're worrying about the sort of east-west values division that it's rearing its head in the European Union and causing a lot of people sleepless nights. And they're worried, of course, about a resurgence of the Eurozone crisis, particularly in Italy and the Italian budget situation. So this is not their most pressing issue, which I think is one of the reasons why, in answer to an earlier question, I said I don't think EU disunity will happen for, for two reasons. One, because the stakes aren't quite high enough for people to put their heads on the par over the parapet. And it means that, basically, if you're an EU member state Let's say you're a Scandinavian government and you're slightly concerned about the way Britain's being treated and you'd like the EU to show more flexibility. You still have to make a decision as to whether you burn political capital in the European Union fighting that corner or whether you keep your powder dry to fight the wars over the Eurozone that are bound to come. And I think everyone's making the calculation that actually this isn't their first priority at the moment. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Tina. <coughs> Will the provisions of the future relationship form part of a formal withdrawal agreement or will there be another document to deal with all of that? Uh, they will be a separate document, but they'll be voted on as a package by the British Parliament. And how will that impact going forward? In, in what way? In how the, the, the process will be, will be managed and... and the crucial thing going forward is that the European Union will not be binding itself. Exactly. Uh, and the government has made noises about making this legally binding in some way, but I find that very, very hard. I find it very, very hard to see how they do okay. that. Yeah. Not least because you'll have a new negotiating team in place uh, next year. Uh, governments might change in Europe, and so preferences might change. Uh, my sense is that what we agree on the future relationship will be political. Now, that doesn't mean... It doesn't have weight, no. but it won't have the weight of a legally binding agreement, I don't think. And I'm yet to hear anything that convinces me that there's a way of making that legally binding. And, and as, as you've indicated, you know, the, the, the complexities of that really do become quite apparent depending on 
where, it, where we end up finding ourselves. And if that is the case, uh, you know, what is the next step uh, if, if there's not that legally binding process uh, that, that gives us the opportunities that, is, uh, that are expected? And, and if there is some changes in some of the uh, views and, 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 and governments across Europe, uh, then, then the, the whole idea then even becomes more problematic going forward. Well, this is where the idea, I think it was the First Minister who first coined the phrase of a blind Brexit yeah. uh, comes into play. Now, for me, a blind Brexit or a blind exit is the necessary outcome of any decision to leave the European Union because of the European Union's own rules. They can't formally negotiate a trade deal with a member state. The Article 50 process is backward rather than forward-looking. So I don't see how you're not at least partially blind okay. Because by law, you can't be anything but. And it is a real danger. And this is where David Davis was absolutely right, that ultimately the problem for the United Kingdom is our maximum moment of leverage is the moment when, if at all, we can link the withdrawal process, and in particular, mm -hmm. the withdrawal bill, with concessions we'd like the European Union to make over the future relationship. The structure of the process, however, means that that's not going to happen. And the danger is that, of course, once we leave, going back to the earlier question, we become even less of a priority once the withdrawal agreement is signed than we are now, and that actually, therefore, moving the trade negotiations forward and getting concessions will be even harder. But I don't see any way around that. Okay, thank you. Can okay, you? thanks. Uh, if I could just ask a supplementary to that, Obviously, as you said, the withdrawal agreement and the transition terms are legally binding, whereas the future relationship's a political statement. Now, we've had a number of UK politicians, such as Michael Gove, who have hinted that we should simply get out and then we can, uh, we can uh, worry about the future after that, or that we can make promises now which we could um, renege on in the future. How do statements like that affect um, the negotiations? Uh, well, it's very hard to say. I mean, I've just come here from the Conservative Party conference and you've got to hope that statements like that don't affect them too badly because that was all we heard in Birmingham. Uh, what was remarkable about Michael Gove's statements was it managed to unite the Brexiters and the government in opposition to them. But there is absolutely no doubt that people on the continent listen to what we say here. And for instance, one of the reasons why the French in particular are absolutely dead set against anything that looks like partial single market membership and are slightly nervous about it even for Northern Ireland is that they've listened to the rhetoric from London since the 1980s about deregulation and they take it seriously. I don't think we've ever acted in the way we've spoken, but a succession of prime ministers from both the big parties have taken great pleasure in going to Brussels and talking about the need to get rid of regulations. And having said this for so long, it's perhaps unsurprising that our European partners are taking it seriously. And that is why one of the big fights to come will be the fight over the so-called level playing field. Is there's a degree of nervousness that whatever we sign up to now, we won't adhere to in the future. And that therefore the European Union is very, very anxious that they get these assurances over a level playing field that we will not diverge from their policies, even in areas that aren't directly covered under the ambit of the future relationship. So I think it's not necessarily what Michael Gove said, but I think it's years of rhetoric have made some of our partners a little bit wary about allowing us to go where we want. Yeah. And we've already heard in this committee that the European Parliament is not comfortable with the agreement that's already been uh, agreed in principle on guaranteeing the rights of EU citizens. The European Parliament um, aren't convinced that the UK will stick by what it's promised there. Well, I mean, it was one of the great insights into our constitutional system that when we started negotiating withdrawal agreement, we, we realised that actually we can't give the kind of long-term guarantees to citizens that the European Union was after because we have sovereignty of parliament and one parliament can't bind the next. Which was why, if you remember early on in the Article 50 process, there was an enormous fight over the European Court of Justice having jurisdiction over the elements of the withdrawal agreement covering the rights of EU citizens. And they ended up with a compromise of, I think, nine years or something like that for for that. So there is, there is concern over it. I personally am not that concerned about the European Parliament trying to block the agreement, uh, not least because one of the interesting things about the Brexit process has been the unprecedented levels of coordination between Commission, Member States and Parliament. The, the European Parliament has been kept in the loop all the way through this process. 
And during the negotiations when we were talking about citizens' rights, their concerns were fed into the EU negotiating position. So, yes, there are concerns about this. I don't think the concerns will go so far as to seeing the European Parliament vote the agreement down, but I think they've ended up with probably the only compromise they could between a legal system that is constitutionalised, that is like the European Union, and one that is far less so like ours. Thank you. Ross Green. Thanks, Commissioner. Continuing this theme around the, the withdrawal agreement in the future uh, relationship agreement, some of the more rational Brexiteers looking at the clock ticking down seem to be going back to where they were, at least rhetorically, a couple of years ago um, in stating that the withdrawal agreement can be managed as essentially a monumental fudge, shifting as much of this as possible into the negotiations on, on the future relationship. So what is currently causing difficulties for the withdrawal agreement their argument is you can fudge that by punting it into the next round of discussions for future relationship. I, I don't see how that works, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on if politically that has any chance at all. You talk about there's a series of games of checking going on here. This seems to be based on the idea that Europe will blink first in that regard. Is there any political possibility of that? Well, I have to say I think you're right and they're wrong in the sense that, yes, this is what is happening and it's very I mean one of the calculations I think of government whips about the vote to come in Parliament is that they will be able to peel off a sufficient number of Brexiters who just want Brexit to happen yeah. because of the threat of a second referendum if the if the agreement gets voted down uh, so I think that that is going on there are some in the Brexit camp who just want us to be out and then we'll sort it out afterwards but you can't fudge the withdrawal agreement uh, you can fudge the future relationship uh, which we want to trade against the withdrawal agreement, so it puts us in a weaker position. But the withdrawal agreement itself, as we've seen in the sections on the money on citizens' rights, has to be crystal clear. And I think, given what has happened over the Irish backstop, the European Union will make certain that there is no scope for ambiguity in the language around that in the version that is finally agreed. You mentioned the idea of second referendum, people's vote, ratification vote. Um, beyond the domestic... British political challenges of whether that is possible or not. Um, how would the 27 react to that? There have been a number of statements from various European politicians who are open to it, but mentioned already the impressive unity of the bloc so far. If the UK political uh, environment got to the point where there was a majority for a people's vote at Westminster, if, if that was the, the direction of travel, do you believe that the 27 would be open to that, bef that being a possibility of that being facilitated before the 29th of March? And, and how early, if, if that was the case, how, how long before the 29th of March would that have to Well, I, I, would, I would draw your, your attention to a recent report. I think it's out or it's about to come out from the Constitutional Unit at UCL, which is about the sort of procedural and legal steps that would need to be taken to get us to a second referendum. And they, they very strongly intimate that actually doing it before the end of March would be just about possible, but extremely difficult. And so there are two different EU issues there then. One is, would they be open to us staying? Uh, to which I think the honest answer is in public, they'd have to be. In private, probably less so among some of them at least. How would we withdraw if we, in speculation upon speculation, were we to have a referendum, were it to decide that we were to remain in, what would happen then? No one legally knows whether we could unilaterally revoke Article 50 or whether we'd have to go back to the negotiating table with them. That's a point over which lawyers disagree. So we don't know. I'm one of the pursuers in the case that's now going to yeah, the CJ on exactly yeah. that. There's question. a very good... Uh, Steve Pears has got a blog on EU law, and one of the blogs in that is a debate between him and Steve Wetherill of the University of Oxford, and they take opposing sides as to whether or not we can unilaterally revoke Article 15. It's well worth reading uh, to see some of the legal issues on that. And the third issue, of course, then, is whether they would grant us an extension in the event that we decided to have a referendum, but we couldn't do it in time. Uh, that's by unanimity, of course. I find it very hard to believe that they wouldn't, partly because I find it quite hard to see us getting to that point under this Prime Minister, in which case we've got a new negotiating team. So it would be very hard for the European Union to say, actually, no, we've had enough of this, let's just stop and you can fall out with no deal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tavish Scott. 
Uh, thank you. Can I ask a more practical question? Um, I'm one of 20,000 Spaniards who cross the runway into Gibraltar every day. What's going to happen at the end of March next year? I think the honest answer I should give you is I'm not entirely certain. No, indeed. Uh, I mean, in the short term, with the transition period, very little will happen. But beyond that, mm -hmm. I do not know. The Spanish seem, I mean, and Spain isn't the most stable of countries politically at the moment either, which adds to the uncertainty over this. Uh, the danger is that a weak Spanish government sees a chance to play the national card by playing hardball over Gibraltar. Uh, I mean, it's one of the one of the tragedies, but one of the ha perhaps inevitable tragedies of the Brexit process is how, given the stakes in in what's going on, places like Gibraltar and places like the Channel Islands have been overlooked mm -hmm. and their special status is not taken into I mean, I don't blame the British government for this because there's so much going on that it's very, very hard to have the bandwidth to do this. But it's very noticeable if you go to Gibraltar or you go to the Channel Islands, that sense of no one's talking about us. So I don't. the honest answer is I don't yeah. know what the future no, holds. No, I appreciate that. Entirely fair. Do, do you think there are any implications for the Northern Ireland border discussion from uh, Gibraltar at all? Is there any linkage uh, because it's another border? Uh, in the abstract, yes. In the political world so far, no. Uh, and I think it's just worth stressing the degree to which the Northern Ireland border is being treated differently by the European Union because the Republic insists that it should be. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the key variable there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a nice example of, you know, the, one of the things that you, if you're a member state mm -hmm. and you really need the support of the European Union and you get it, it makes a big difference. I'm sure the Gibraltar government were in Birmingham like you and that yeah. kind of thing, but they're just not getting through, are they? No. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the government of Gibraltar, I mean, I should say, have been tireless. Yeah. I mean, barely a day goes by where you don't see them in Absolutely. Parliament or at the party conferences. I mean, they have been they have been working this as hard as they possibly can. I mean, to the point where at least people are aware of the fact that there is a Gibraltar issue. <laughs> but how, that's, how that sort of rises up in political salience, I just don't see, just because of the scale of the other issues that are involved in this. Yeah. Okay. The other question is thank you. The other question I was going to ask was, um, fisheries is getting well and truly done over here because we're we're soon to be in a position where our fisheries minister and indeed the UK fisheries minister won't even be at the round table where they sort out quotas for the future. I mean that just sets that's going to be what it's going to be like for for lots of industries in the future, isn't it? We're, we're, that's an industry where already this experience is real now. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean we won't be around the table. I don't know what what the solution on fisheries is going to be. Again, I can point you to one of our teams. There's a guy called Craig McAngus at the University of the West of Scotland who is doing a big research project on Brexit and fisheries and what it means for Scottish fishing communities. And I'd advise you to look at his website and even maybe talk to him at some point because he knows everything about fish there is to know, which is not something I could say of me. But yes, the broader point on regulation is absolutely true, which is why I have my... I mean, even with, with, with something like checkers... I don't think that solves the problem for manufacturing to the degree that people seem, seem to think it does, in the sense that for manufacturers, as important as customs and tariffs is the issue of regulation. I was talking to someone from one of the sort of high-end car manufacturers recently, and they were saying, well, look, we sell expensive cars. If there's a 10% tariff, we just stick it on the price and no one will notice. But what we don't want is to know that you know, Fiat and Co are sitting around a table setting the regulations that will determine what our cars look like in the future and we're not even in the room. So you're absolutely right. Not being around that table mm -hmm. when the regulations are negotiated is something that concerns a lot of manufacturing firms in this country. I, I agree. And did, I mean, last week the boss of PAS said Vauxhall would go on to short term if not close, Nissan uh, and La Jaguar Land Rover bosses have all said much the same in the last week in the run-up to the Tory party conference. And I didn't notice the Prime Minister making any observations about the economy of the car industry. But yet Greg Clark signed some kind of deal with Nissan, which we don't know what it is, about a year and a half ago. Can you shed any light on, on what was... What, what, what is, is there a deal for Nissan that's different from some of these other, other car companies? I have no, absolutely no idea what was, what was done with Nissan. What I would say, though, I mean, I think it's worth clarifying that the car manufacturers, I think, were talking about a no-deal scenario, not a deal scenario. Mm. Uh, and I think the, the the head of the Royal Bank of Scotland was on the Today programme today, it saying also yeah. talking about that. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anyone has said they're going to close in the event that we leave the European Union. Uh, it will be interesting to see what happens in the future. I mean, talking to the big foreign car firms, 
what they will say is obviously this will make things harder and we'll have to reassess but equally they'll say we have a lot of sunk costs in the United Kingdom. We've paid an awful lot of money for plant, so we're not just going to close that down and walk away. So, for instance, in the case of BMW, they have those the, the, the plants and the infrastructure here, and I think we're also their second biggest export market. So I don't think it'll be as extreme as people sort of walking away because of the previous investments they've made and because of the importance of this market, but it certainly will give them cause to rethink how they do things. And actually, perhaps the most interesting person to listen to on this who has become quite a character now is the Japanese ambassador. Uh, who is sort of palpably upset about what is going on and the implications it has for the Japanese. But your main point, Professor, is the regulation is the bit that matters as much no, as... Not the regulation is the bit that matters, but the regulation matters as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, Honda have gone on record to say how much a disruption at the ports will, will cost them because of their just-in-time supply chain. So I'm not for a moment saying the customs arrangements don't matter, but I'm saying it's important not to forget the regulatory stuff because for some manufacturers, at least, that is absolutely fundamental as well. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, on that point, the um, point that's been made to this committee is that it's increasingly difficult to separate manufacturing from, from services, uh, from goods from services. You know, if you, if you buy an engine, for example, you still have a service agreement on that engine. So um, it's, you can't separate the two. And to go, to go back to my earlier points, we seem to be accepting that we're talking as if, you know, how do we implement checkers when, again, so many people at the very top of the European Union have said that that division between goods and services is simply unacceptable. Well, I'll say several things to that. Uh, one, yes, you're absolutely right that services and goods are often bundled. Uh, and I think Rolls-Royce re re uh, reveals some figures about the, the proportion of his exports that are actually services, that are service contracts and maintenance contracts tied to the goods that it exports. So, yes. Uh, secondly, though... There is that separation that will be allowable for Northern Ireland in the event that the backstop is implemented. So it is possible to do, however messy it is. Uh, and thirdly, as I recall, about two or three weeks ago, Michel Barnier came out with some figures about the potential damage that British comparative advantage would be in the event that we were in some bits of the single market and not the others. And I still haven't seen where those figures come from, convincingly. Uh, so, yes, you're right, it's difficult, doesn't mean it's impossible, and it is on the table in a manner... But can you, just pressure, you keep going back and saying, well, maybe this kind of fudge is possible for Northern Ireland, but it's absolutely impossible for the rest of the UK, even if it was possible for Northern Ireland. The European Union would never accept it. Well, it might be politically impossible, but I'm, my, my argument is, in principle, it is not impossible, because if you're doing it for Northern Ireland, it is in principle possible. Uh, I think then we get to a political and interest-driven argument, which is absolutely fine, that they will not, at the moment, they're saying they will not accept it for the United Kingdom. Yeah. I mean, Donald Tusk said, everybody shared the view that while there are positive elements in the Chequers proposal, the suggested framework for economic cooperation will not work, not least because it risks undermining the single market. Yeah. OK, uh, Kenny Gibson. Kenny uh, thanks, Gibson. Uh, convener. Just uh, the Conservative Conference the, uh, this week, they announced that migrants would have to earn £50,000 a year before they came into the UK. Now, obviously, there's serious um, economic implications of that, but what, would they, what are the implications for the negotiations of that announcement? Well, they're, they're for the future, remember. This isn't about people already here. This is about people coming in in the future, and the implications are that they will respond in kind to Brits who want to go and work in other EU member states. So it will cause a hardening of attitudes, basically? It'll cause, it'll cause a hardening of attitudes, and, and generally when people are talking about immigration policy, the, the two sides involve responding kind. So, yeah, it'll become harder for British people to go to other EU member states. And bear in mind as well, I mean, it's worth stressing the point, Brits living or working in other EU member states will have rights, but they will lose the right of free move, freedom of movement. So there are interesting questions around the person who lives in Germany and works in Luxembourg, mm -hmm. the Brit, for instance, because they'll have the rights in the country they live, but how portable those are is something we have to talk about in the future. And that's what Brits living in the rest of the United States. And it's the final point, I would say, because I think we don't talk enough about this, the, the situation and status of Brits living in other EU member states, is they will perhaps be the group that is most badly and immediately affected in the event of no deal. Because, of course, we have legal provisions in place now for EU citizens who are already here, or 
will be in place. Whereas in, in member states, many member states, nothing has been done legally to address the issue of what happens to British nationals uh, in the event of no deal, because they're all waiting for the sign-off of the withdrawal agreement. Mm -hmm. And so in, 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 in other EU member states, British nationals will fall into a weird kind of legal limbo because they won't be covered by the law. They won't be covered by the provisions of what it says about the European Union because they won't be EU citizens anymore. And yet there will be no immigration law about them because they wouldn't have drafted it yet. Thanks very much. Uh, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, apologies for arriving um, late this morning to the meeting. Um, in the, I understand we've already discussed the Northern Ireland issue before I've arrived, but in your um, evidence to the committee, you also mentioned the geographical indicators, the intellectual property rights and the protection of personal data. There's been other issues within the withdrawal agreement that are causing difficulty. Um, can you give us an update on where you think negotiations are with that and are we likely to get a uh, a consensus on these issues? The honest answer is I can't, I'm afraid. I haven't sort of followed the... I spent two weeks at party conferences and not been paying much attention to what's been happening in Brussels. So, I mean, the geographic indicators was certainly a big issue two or three weeks ago. Whether they made any progress, I just don't know. Okay. Well, it's interesting you mentioned party conference because it does slightly go back to the Northern Ireland issue, but my observations of the Conservative concert conference over the last week that there was a very firm emphasis on the union and the idea of unionism. And Arlene Foster had a fairly high profile presence at that conference. Um, how do you feel that impacts on the difficulties there are in trying to reach an agreement on the Ireland issue? Because I did have concerns about the message that gave to the rest of, um, to Northern Ireland and to Ireland and to the European Union, that there was such a strong emphasis I think it's worth emphasising this point, actually, because I think it's often misunderstood. It is the Conservative and Unionist Party. I think even if the current British government were not dependent for, vote, for the votes of the DUP, this would be a massive political issue for, for the Conservative and indeed for parts of the Labour Party as well. Uh, no one, wa I mean, you know, I think it was Dominic Grieve who said during the withdrawal agreement debates in July that uh, he does not know a parliamentarian who would vote for the implementation of the backstop as it is currently drafted. Uh, there is a very strong feeling amongst many MPs that they cannot preside over what they see as the separation of one part of the United Kingdom from another. And there are two aspects of that, if I may, just quickly. First is the one that we're all talking about, which is checks. Uh, that is to say, physical checks and the symbolic and political importance they would have. But the other of which, which I think is going to be equally important, is that of legal jurisdiction. Uh, Mr. Greaves' point, as far as I understood it, is what would be unacceptable for him would be the notion that part of the territory of the United Kingdom would fall under a legal system over which we have no say. But so you, it is absolutely a, 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 a very, very serious political issue. Yeah. The concern I had, do you not think that doesn't recognise the history of Northern Ireland, the conflict that's been in Northern Ireland, the, um, the, the solution that came with the Good Friday Agreement, that membership of the European Union allowed a feeling within Northern Ireland that you could almost, you could choose where if you were, you could feel that you were part of Ireland, if that was, you had a European membership, mm -hmm. and you're also part of the UK. And this emphasis on... Unionism as an idea in relation to Northern Ireland, to me, just seems problematic at a stage when we are trying to reach a solution that maintains the integrity of the Good Friday Agreement. Absolutely. And here, actually, I'd recommend the work of Katie Hayward at Queen's University in Belfast, who understands that border like no one else, I think. Uh, but the paradox here, I think, is that since the Good Friday Agreement essentially in the case of both Northern Ireland and actually to a degree Scotland, what we have done is work to make borders more ambiguous. That is to say, you can have national identities, but the borders between them are fuzzy and the people can move quite freely. But Brexit was a reassertion of a rather old-fashioned notion of borders. I, there's the border, we control it, it is clear. Uh, and trying to reconcile those two, particularly in the case of Northern Ireland, is, is proving massively difficult as it was always going to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have uh, Stuart McMillan and Annabel Ewing would both like to come back in. Stuart? Sure, thank you, Convener. Um, it's just a, one question about something that was uh, said at the recent Conservative conference, uh, and it was uh, Jeremy Hunt's uh, comments regarding the EU and the Soviet prison camp. 
Um, now, he has since also backtracked on those, uh, on those comments. But nonetheless, uh, he did state them uh, at, on the conference floor. Do you think this type of thing is actually going to help uh, negotiations? And, and, and how do you think that it will actually affect uh, relationships? Uh, bearing in mind uh, that we're still in a situation of, uh, of no deal has been agreed. Well, I don't think we should fall into the trap of thinking this is in any way new. Uh, I mean, one EU ambassador put it to me at the conference, disappointed but not surprised. Uh, and I think that kind of sums it up. I think, you know, our European partners are aware of the way our politicians act, particularly at party conferences. I don't think it's particularly helpful, no. I think it's particularly unhelpful in the sense that insofar as you alienate some people more than others, you alienate those EU member states on whom we might otherwise have relied the most for support, uh, i.e. the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, saying something that's going to offend the Baltic states strikes me as bad foreign policy. Uh, but it is just it is just the tenor of language that we have at, at, at party conferences is a different thing. and, at, and it, and you're talking to a different audience. And I know, you know, the papers are full of these reports saying Conservatives act as if no one else can hear them outside the room. And I don't think it's that. I just think it is the fact that, you know, once a year they go with the party faithful and a party that is very, very badly divided and they all go lowest common denominator. Okay. And just one final question. Uh, after the 29th of March, at some point in the future, when, uh, uh, when the economy does uh, turn and the economy starts to... Uh, starts to suffer, costs start going up, and uh, and it potentially could get harder to actually obtain food uh, within the UK. Bear in mind, there's now a, this new a new minister that the UK government have uh, introduced. Um, how easy, uh, how easy would, do you think it would be for the uh, for the UK to rejoin the EU to to change its mind uh, when the, the UK economy is in, in a pretty bad way in, in the near future? Well, I think we probably just need to dig into the idea a little bit about what happens to the British economy. Uh, there seems little doubt that Brexit is already having an impact on the British economy. The, uh, John Springford at the Centre for European Reform is doing, a, I think, monthly uh, estimate of what Brexit has cost the UK economy to date. And I think his, most latest, his, his latest estimates came out last weekend, if I remember rightly. So there's an impact. The, there is a danger, and I see this amongst sort of remain campaigners now of exaggerating or over-dramatising what that impact will be. Leaving the single market and the customs union will impact on the British economy. Okay? It won't impact straight away. There will be other impacts, like we're almost certainly seeing a big slowdown in investments at the moment because, I mean, because common sense dictates that we are, that companies are waiting to see what happens before they invest. We won't I mean, to all intents and purposes, leave the single market and the customs union until after transition. And that's when those effects will start to hit, and depending on whatever trade deal we might get, okay? What the estimates suggest is that that will lead to, in the area of a 5% hit to the British economy, and by hit to the British economy, it's worth being very specific, 5% smaller than it would otherwise have been over a period of years. Okay, this isn't the British economy shrinking by five percent on exit day, and what the point I'm trying to make here is, I think the economic impacts of Brexit, while real, will be far more subtle uh, than a lot of people are making them out to be. Far more subtle, far more harder to discern, particularly if employment levels stay relatively high, uh, and far more difficult to pin on the single issue of Brexit because it's happening over a period of years. So we shouldn't necessarily assume that all of a sudden everyone turns around and says, oh my God, the economy is doing worse. It's because we've left. Essentially, the way you'll know our economy is feeling an impact of leaving the European Union is if you pick up the FT and you look at a graph of growth across Europe and see that ours is lower than everyone else in the Eurozone. And most people don't do that. Uh, so that, that's the first cautionary note, if you like, is that it's going to be relatively subtle, this impact. As to your, the, the meat of your question, if we want to rejoin, we can apply to rejoin, but we apply to rejoin like everyone else. I think there are two things worth bearing in mind here. One, what will the political context in the United Kingdom be that would allow that? And I think insofar as the impacts that you talk about are visible, it is perfectly conceivable that 
a majority or a large proportion of the British people, rather than thinking, oh my God, that was a mistake, we should rejoin, will think we were absolutely right to leave because the reason our economy isn't doing very well is because they punished us on purpose. So we might, in the short to medium term, see a hardening of anti-EU attitudes in this country if the economy doesn't do very well. But even assuming that a government decides that it is right to, to attempt to rejoin, they will then face the problem that they will not get the special, the special opt-outs and that Britain enjoys as a member now. So we're talking about the budget rebate. We're potentially, though not necessarily, talking about Schengen and the Eurozone as well, is we will be applying to rejoin, almost certainly applying to rejoin on terms that are far more less favourable and far more politically contentious than our current membership was. Sorry, that was a very long sentence. Sorry, I have to get Miss Ewing and Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you. Just briefly, um, I, I, I mean, you know, listen to, to the, the debate this morning, and obviously there's there's uh, so many unknowns at this stage. But I'm um, surely one known is that Chequers is dead. Uh, the EU has said that. If you read that what is proposed, it is incompatible with the rules of the club. So you can't be a half. You can't be half pregnant. You know, you're in the club or you're not in the club. So if checkers, if that is correct, I mean, what is plan B on the part of the UK government? Do, do you think they have a plan B or C or D or E? Or what in the next few weeks, you know, checkers is unworkable, checkers is unworkable, checkers it says the EU. What does the UK do? Put its hands over its ears? I don't know what. You've just come from the horse's mouth in Birmingham. What, what is the feeling <coughs> about a plan B? The only thing I get from party conferences is not knowledge, but flu as a general <laughs> rule. But uh, I'd say, so. well, look, the government has said it's going to come up with a new set of proposals on the Irish border. Unfortunately, it looks like those proposals might not be ready for the October Council, though we don't know yet. Uh, so that will be an element of Plan B, the new proposals on the Irish border. Chequers was never an outcome. It was an opening gambit, and it was a political signal. Uh, and it was quite a powerful political signal in some ways, wasn't it? It was a political signal that said the Prime Minister is willing to try and compromise to the point of causing political problems to herself by making ministers resign. And it was also, if nothing else, a very powerful statement of the fact that the Br British government cannot be accused of not taking the Irish border issue seriously because Chequers was written with the Irish border and very little else in mind. I mean, it is a plan to prevent a border on the island of Ireland. So it was partly like everything in political negotiations about signalling. It was about signalling to the Irish and to the EU, look, we are going to do everything we can to avoid this. No one in the British government expected that they would just tick checkers and say fine, but they expect there to be a negotiation, and the government is saying, OK, come back with the specific gripes you have, and we will negotiate, and that's what's going on. The one thing we haven't talked about, which I hope we don't talk about because I'm no expert on it, but I think is fundamental, are the government's customs plans. And there I think the European Union is simply saying, look, you're in the customs union, not in the customs union, but these sort of fancy down arrangements that you're suggesting at the moment just won't fly, partly for the reason you said before, because it's a question of legal authority. You can't have your tariffs and your border policed by something that is outside your legal jurisdiction is the EU's position, and I don't see that changing. Thank you. Just, just to finish off, I won't ask you about uh, detailed arrangements about the, the customs plan, but I was struck um, where you were talking about you know, the scenario of, uh, of a free trade agreement if the Brexiteers went out. And at the very end of the paper that you submitted to us, you said that modelling work by the UK in a changing Europe shows that livestock farmers in particular would be badly hit by the scenario of uh, zero tariffs that would accompany a free trade deal. And you said that the modelling also demonstrated that Scotland would be worst affected in the scenario of unilateral tariff removal, particularly if direct payments were, were moved as well. And, uh, you know, obviously beef farmers in Scotland you singled out as being particularly vulnerable. Um, is there any more that you can tell us about that? Because obviously that's of, of great interest. I represent an area of Scotland where we have, uh, you know, 28% of uh, the, the, the beef uh, uh, heard, um, it will be of great concern uh, to people in my constituency. What I can certainly do is, is point the clock in the direction of that research and the people who do it at the University of Newcastle, because I'm many things but not a macroeconomist, and I'd rather they spoke for themselves. But what I would say is here, I mean, the, here is, is one area where the, the, the Tory party conference was absolutely fascinating, 
because it seems to me there is an ideological fight going on within the Conservative Party, and agriculture is one of the key things at stake here. There are some people in the Conservative Party who are saying Brexit is an opportunity to remove subsidies, to cut tariffs, to have cheap food. And there are other people in the Conservative Party, I'm talking about the Parliamentary Party, whose response would be to paraphrase, are you mad? I live in a rural constituency, we'll never win it again. And I remember I was, at a, I was at a fringe event at the Tory party conference about agriculture, and it was fascinating because person after person in the audience put their hand up and said, look, I voted Brexit, I'm a Brexiter, but... And the buts were, in no particular order, we want to maintain a steady flow of seasonal labour or our business model is unsustainable. We want a continuation of subsidies or our business model becomes unsustainable. We need to maintain tariffs or our business model remains unsustainable. We need to keep EU regulations and therefore access to the EU market or our business model becomes unsustainable. So there is a big debate to be had about agriculture. So we need to ditch Brexit or our business model is unsustainable. Well, <laughs> that, is, well that is not what they're saying, but of course you do have that paradox in the farming sector where you know, the NFU was advising people to vote Remain and the evidence suggests the majority of farmers voted to leave. Well, thank you very much for that. It was very interesting. And uh, we'll have a short suspension to allow for the changeover as witnesses. Thank you, Professor Menon. Thank you.
second agenda item this morning is an evidence session on the proposed transient visitor levy. Um, this is the committee's second evidence session on this issue, following on from an evidence session with local authority representatives on the 13th of September. Our witnesses today are Fiona Campbell, the Chief Executive of the Association of Scotland's Self-Caterers, Mark Crothall, uh, Chief, Chief Executive of the Scottish Tourism Alliance, Peter Irvin, MBE, author and founder of Unique Events, and William McLeod, the Executive Director for Scotland of UK Hospitality. Uh, welcome and thank you for coming to give evidence to us today. Uh, now, I've been indicated that no one wants to make any opening statements, so if I could um, perhaps open by asking the panel uh, what their view is on the announcement this week by the First Minister uh, of a, a, a consultation uh, on the transient uh, visitor levy. And, and secondly, um, could I ask those members representing the industry what uh, research they have done on the impact of any uh, transient visitor levy should it be implemented? Uh, who would like to start? Well, good morning. And th uh, do we have to press a button to speak, or are no, you, you hearing us okay? You can no. just <coughs> good morning, freely. and uh, uh, thank you on behalf of us all, really, for the opportunity of uh, uh, presenting to you this morning. Um, uh, I think I can speak for for the three of us here from the industry uh, side that we very much welcome uh, the announcement from the first minister. Uh, we wait to see the detail of, uh, of what emerges from that. <laughs> But I think it responds really to a request we made to the Culture Secretary uh, for uh, the Scottish Government to, to really uh, begin to take control of the uh, debate uh, that's been running for quite some time on the introduction of a tourist tax or a, a transient visitor levy. Um, we felt that uh, to a certain extent, and my, my colleagues can speak for, the, for themselves, but uh, we felt that the, there was an assumption from COSLA and the local authority side that the principle of a tourist tax, uh, a TVL, uh, coming into place had been established, and the principle that it would be devolved and localised had also been established. And certainly in my case, if, if that's the case, then that's passed me by. Um, we, we feel that there's a whole range of issues that need to be discussed and debated um, before we reach that issue of the principle of a tax coming in. Um, certainly from a UKH perspective, uh, our, uh, op the reasons for our opposition uh, are, I hope, clearly enough set out in the, the paper uh, we submitted. But I, I think uh, we're some way away uh, as yet. I think we, we need to look at what existing research there is. I think we need to look at what new research might need to be commissioned. Uh, I don't think there's been any real assessment of uh, why we need a tourist tax or a TVL. And uh, I think um, we need to establish that first of all. And uh, if there's a need for it, what are the options? And uh, there's been no real assessment made of the impacts on consumers or businesses. Turning to the latter part of your question, um, what research have we done? I, I personally, for UKH, uh, we've done quite a bit of research looking at uh, existing studies. Uh, we've looked at tourist taxes uh, in Europe. We've looked at um, VAT rates in Europe, which all part, form part of our submission. Uh, but more recently, uh, because nobody else had done it, uh, we took a bit of a punt and started looking at what the economic impact uh, of uh, a TVL or tourist tax might be at the Scotland level. Uh, we looked at what the uh, accommodation industry turnover was in Scotland. We looked at average room rates. Uh, we looked at uh, the, the percentage increase uh, on accommodation spend that might be represented by a new tax. And we also looked at um, applying to that um, academic research that, that looks at tourism price uh, sensitivities. And our view is that if there's a two pounds per night per room uh, tourist tax applied throughout Scotland, uh, that that could result in uh, reduced turnover of 100 million for the accommodation industry and 75 million of reduced uh, spend in other parts of the tourism economy. So our preliminary figures would be uh, reduced spend of 175 million. So that work, as I understand it, is work that's underway? We, we have concluded that preliminary work. Right. And when are you publishing the 
Mm. We, we have published it in that it, it was covered by the media last weekend and I'm sharing that uh, information with anybody who's interested in hearing it. Right. But you're going to be doing more? Not at the moment. No, We're waiting, no. I think, to see what the, okay. what the government's position is and how the government intends to proceed with uh, the consultation that was announced by the First Minister on Tuesday. OK. Mr Crottle. Yes, I mean, I, I echo what uh, what Willie said. It was obviously at our national conference on Monday that the announcement was made, and it was something as you know, we were we welcomed in terms of the the ask as had been uh, for exactly that from our, our member council group. And I think um, what I'd like to stress, obviously, the Scottish Tourism Alliance has under its umbrella of membership around 75% of the total industry, and our member council is is made up of a broad <coughs> range of of trade bodies, and they are not just accommodation providers. So when we um, convened um, following um, the, uh, I suppose, the, the hotting up of the conversation uh, in and around Edinburgh and from COSLA, in particular in response to the COSLA paper, the council member group convened. And, um, you know, those members include the Scottish Tour Guides Association, the Confederation of Passenger Transport, Green Tourism, um, the Scottish Country Sports Tourism Group, obviously the Licensed Trade, Sales Scotland, a couple of destinations, the visitor attraction sector, and every one of us or every one of those bodies were unanimous in their decision, in their view that this is not something that should just be rushed through uh, without you know, significant consideration and research as to the impact of uh, a levy being uh, applied, if it were to be, because it clearly it would be felt uh, within the wider uh, economy. Um, you know, there would be less money to be spent in some of these smaller attractions on the high street, and the knock-on effect is considerable. And I think significantly picking up on, on what's been said is that one thing that maybe is being presumed by many is that we've enjoyed a significant rise in international visitors. We've had a very, uh, as a result of the exchange rate, obviously our tourism numbers in 17 were very well you know, received by everybody, but there is a marked decline and evidence to suggest that the domestic market, of which 60% of Scotland's tourism market is domestic, is actually slipping away, uh, and the ability to spend um, by that particular audience is, is declining. I think everybody in this room, if you're like me, which I'm sure you are, are feeling the squeeze on your own household outcome, uh, household expenditure. Um, and you know, even the statistics that are, have been reported uh, showing the 17-18 um, change, um, whilst they're very healthy, if you look back and compare the visitor spend and the behaviours of that domestic market, our core market, it's showing 13.6% you know, decline um, on 2016. And as we enter into what is an uncharted waters of Brexit in front of us, uh, and a lot of uncertainty, the risk of actually getting to a tipping point where a tax is collected on, uh, from that particular audience um, could send many businesses over the cliff. Uh, and um, you know, without that analysis and that really in-depth economic modelling being done, it would be very foolish to, to rush through into taking forward what, as Willie has alluded to already, um, certain authorities you know, are far further down the track in assuming that it could be applied. Um, so I suppose um, we've also done just in other bits of evidence in terms of gathering information, something that we um, had reported or gathered in, in sight and, and uh, it was reported in the Glasgow in the Herald on Sunday two weeks ago, is um, the reality, I suppose, of cost to business. And yes, top line suggests that, you know, industry is doing, or perceptions are that all the industry is doing well because numbers are, numbers are strong. Well, in every case of all the hotels, large and small groups across, dif across different parts of Scotland, shows an erosion of margin and profit, and therefore their ability to reinvest, not in their asset to stay competitive, but also their people is marginalised. And um, if you then had to a further tax, albeit it's being quoted as a visitor tax, there is a cost to business to doing that, and that's yet another, another cost to be borne, which could, again, tip people over the edge. Okay. Ms Campbell, do you want to add anything to that? Absolutely. Well, I think as a sector, uh, the ASSE represents over 650 businesses, which uh, is approximately 7,000 properties in Scotland. Um, our sector alone represents £723 million to the Scottish economy. So I think, um, on the whole, we, we absolutely welcome the First Minister's uh, 
determination to have an industry-wide consultation. I think it's absolutely essential to underpin any kind of policy decision with data and to make sure there's an absolutely robust economic impact assessment of any kind of tourist levy on our sector and also on the other sectors that support our sector. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr Irvin, you're in quite a unique position, if you pardon the pun, in that you have uh, you have run a very successful business, but you also have an overview as, as an author. Um, what's your view? Well, I, I certainly welcome that this consultation is taking place. And I think it may be that there are voices there uh, that are not being heard. And um, although I don't have uh, stats and surveys at, at my uh, fingertips at all, uh, I do have a, quite a lot of personal experience. Uh, every, as you said, I'm, <clears throat> I'm an author and I have a guidebook to Scotland and every three years it's updated and I've just completed that process. It takes many months, of course. And I probably go to more hotels and accommodation providers than anybody else. And I stay in them and I talk to them and I see what's going on. And so I have sort of views about that, which are, you know, from personal experience. Um, I came into this debate, as it were, certainly in my head and, and among my colleagues, because <clears throat> for many years I was on the board of Festivals Edinburgh, and of course I was the founder and director um, and running a private business to make Edinburgh's Hogmanay happen for 25 years. And as those years went by, um, I began to feel quite strongly, I used to sort of wish the accommodation sector would put something into this because I knew in the beginning that hotels were empty and guest houses were closed and by the end of it rack rates were you know higher than any other city in Europe we discovered the rack rate over those few days at the end of December um, and I, I increased it. this is a, a, a festival that was funded by the city of Edinburgh Council of course so whatever they were putting in was what we had to, 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 to use to create this amazing um, magnet for international visitors from over 80 countries. Um, but it was yours truly who actually had to pick up the tab if it wasn't going well, um, because the only other source of income was ticket sales. And uh, we could lose a fortune on our, 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 our rainy night or when we had a cancellation or whatever. So, and as the years went by, all the costs of programming that uh, went up health and safety regulations, etc., went up and up. But the council were increasingly loath to put more money in. In fact, they, they couldn't. Now, the situation has changed. I stopped doing uh, Hogmanay uh, just over a year ago. The company that ran it now, ran it now has a different business model. They have bars in the city centre, many of. Um, as far as I'm aware, they don't pay any rates or whatever. So th that's a very lucrative, very, very lucrative business. And that allows the city of Edinburgh Council to sort of decrease um, the, what the putting in. But I think this, the, the principle still pertains um, that, and as I understand it, I may be wrong, but th this argument, this debate stems from the fact perhaps right now that the City of Edinburgh Council wish to consider introducing uh, a, a levy. And um, so I would argue, perhaps we will talk a bit more about this, that Edinburgh is not just a, 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 a different case, it's an exceptional, an extraordinary case. The city of Edinburgh, from what I can see, from when I travel around the world and, and travel around Scotland, Edinburgh is an exceptional case. And I think those of us that live here um, are, are aware that in the last few years, there's become an extraordinary tide of, of, of tourism that has landed on our shores here in this city. More buses, more tourist buses, open top buses, uh, more people in the Royal Mile, more people really everywhere, more Airbnb, all those things. Now, I, I think there's a holistic approach to be taken to all that. This is just part of it. But um, I, I would suggest that certain parts of Scotland, the Highlands, particularly, of course, Skye, famously full, um, <coughs> and Edinburgh, that we should um, we should use this debate to talk about that, not around this table, of course, but generally. Okay, That's very interesting. Um, now, I'm going to move on to other members of the committee. If I could just say, with these, uh, we're quite 
pushed for time and we have quite a large uh, four member panel so you don't don't feel that you all have to answer every question um, and if you agree with the um, other um, panelists please uh, say I'll move on to um, Claire Baker. Um, thank you convener I would just like to say I've already met with Fiona Campbell we met to discuss this issue among another of issues concerning her sector and um, what I'd like to ask this morning is obviously we heard the evidence a couple of weeks ago from COSLA and local authorities if the panel recognised the pressures that were identified by Edinburgh, uh, the case given by Aberdeen and Highland Council. Uh, Mr Irvin has already given an explanation of how he feels Edinburgh is under pressure, but do the other panel members recognise the issues around uh, the ability to do street cleaning, the state of the roads, the general services that need to be um, need to be delivered by the council as we see an influx of visitors into that area and the strain that puts on what already tightened local authority budgets? Large start. I, mean, I certainly, I, I think, uh, if you work in tourism, uh, it's impossible not to be aware of and recognise that there are certain parts of the country that, that come under pressure from time to time, the more popular areas. Um, I, I think uh, we have to think a little bit more about cause and effect, and I, I think you have to begin to, to strip down the, the visitor market into different components. Um, if, for example, a, a visitor levy or a tourist tax is... It becomes a reality, it would be applied to people who stay in commercial accommodation. Uh, yet um, these are the staying visitors who contribute most to the economy of the destination. They spend more, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, I, I think um, uh, we, we have to look at uh, other sectors of the market. I mean, if we take Edinburgh, for example, uh, if I'm correct, 5 million staying visitors a year, probably accounting for 15 or 16 million uh, visitor nights, yet the city attracts 18 and a half million day visitors. And I think you have to look at where the, where the pressures are coming from. And it's the staying visitors that are enabling the, the, the businesses, in our case accommodation businesses, but also the other businesses they're spending money in. It, that enables them to pay the non-domestic rates they're paying. It enables them to uh, remit the VAT they do to the exchequer. And uh, I, I think we've got to put in perspective uh, the amount of money that our, our visitors are already paying in taxes through VAT. Uh, their expenditure enables businesses to pay business rates, and businesses expect to have a certain amount of infrastructure uh, provided uh, in, in return for the contribution they're making. Um, I, I would obviously agree um, wholeheartedly with what Willie said there, and I think it comes back to the changing behaviour of the, of the tourists as well, particularly, our, again, our domestic market. Um, there's a significant increase in the number of day trips now, possibly driven by the fact that people can't afford to go and stay in accommodation anymore. So you are seeing a bigger volume coming into destinations at peak times. And I suppose picking up on, on, on Pete's comment about Sky, um, one of the, um, the things that the Scottish Tourism Alliance are very involved with in terms of leading and shaping, and um, I'm uh, in the hot seat of chairing the Future Tourism Strategy Group for uh, the strategy beyond 20. 20 is looking at what are the barriers to growth and a lot of that barrier is is um, arguably about we need to get people um, moved around the country to different parts of the country spread the load um, invest into infrastructure to allow them to do that but you know success breeds success and clearly where you have um, hugely successful festivals and they continue to grow then understandably people will want to come and visit but the revenue streams that are now being derived from festivals as well are growing too um, so there is you know how do you um, how do you compensate or penalise, you know, individuals who perhaps aren't coming to the festival or, you know, visiting the city at a different time of year for a completely different purpose. Um, and I'd use, I'd use an example. I was in a meeting up in Inverness, and like Pete, I get around the country a fair bit. Uh, and there are misperceptions of, of a number of, of, of people around the, the impacts and the costs and the contributions that, uh, that you know, society pays, particularly the, the, the UK residents, who I say are 60% of our market. But the quote was, well, what's three pounds per person? It's less than a pint of beer. Well, a family of five, if it's based on that, three pounds per person to stay in Inverness in a small B&B, &B, nothing, or even a premier in or whatever that's 105 pounds extra on my actually on my my um my bill now first of all a would i afford to be able to do that but more importantly of course i want to go to inverness and 
I want to spend that money in the community and in the small businesses that are actually there and take your children to the attractions. So I think there is, there's, yes, you know, going back to the question of pressure on destinations, absolutely. The destinations are growing. Globally, tourism is growing. I've just come back from a conference in China. The same issues were there. The same discussions were had. The same in Australia. But on every one of the panels that I sat on, Every single person's view was tourism tax is not the way to go. We should be finding alternative solutions to fund and source um, you know, a better quality experience, but not tax a visitor even more. The world's a small place. Scotland is a very small place. We need to be competitive. I mean, the principle that's been proposed is that a local authority could set it on rates. And what we heard from local authorities last week is that they would seek to do that in a way that wouldn't damage their local businesses. And the figures that Mark Crothall suggested aren't on the table from any local authorities. I think Edinburgh suggests on £2 a night per room. It cost me £2.70 to buy a takeaway coffee this morning. Um, and I think the issues around affordability need to be more closely looked at. And if, you know, one of the reasons I'd imagine driving our interest in overseas tourism is the weakness of the pound. So at the moment, visitors who are coming over to Scotland um, are benefiting from a weak currency and that will be encouraging our visitors. So the issue of affordability, I mean, you've said there's a lack of evidence around how it impacts. Um, some of the evidence I think we heard last week and I think in some of the papers we've received is that the difference might be a percentage, a 1.5 percentage around the margins of what kind of impact it could have. And um, have the panel considered any of the positive impacts it might give um, for their businesses if something like this was to be introduced? Do you think there's anything positive in it at all? Could I, could I say f further to, to that, that as I understand it, any uh, levy um, can be, it can be decided um, how, it's, how it's levied and who receives it, so that children, it's, you know, the, 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 the data that we see in, in the documents, c clearly um, cities set their own, you know, scheme so that children don't pay, long stay people don't pay, long stay would be disastrous in Edinburgh because the honeypot of August would be seriously affected if all those performers and all those tech people that come to the city can't be put up in hotels or accommodation. So anything over 10 days <clears throat> would have to be exempt as it were and, uh, and children would be exempt and and there, there would be other exemptions, self-catering perhaps. I, you know. Surely it's possible to work a sort of system whereby all these considerations are taken into account, but there is still a revenue, um, particularly in Edinburgh. I, I, I agree, South West Scotland and all those other places where you can get hotels really cheaply at the moment couldn't sustain probably any increases. But I would suggest that Edinburgh could, should seriously look at it and the revenues of it, which is a whole other story, what happens to them, who gets them, should improve not just the, the visitor experience, but what it's like to live with an influx of tourists. And, and it was often remarked to me as I went around that we should now think of Skye as we think of Venice and we should think of Edinburgh as we think of Barcelona. And these are extraordinary historic and, and landscape, small rural places, uh, in the case of Skye, that we have to protect. Thank you very much. Um, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, uh, Convener. Good morning. You've already indicated that you know the, the Small Business Federation, Chamber of Commerce, the Alliance, the Licence Trade believe this is bad for business. Uh, can I ask about what the involvement has been with the Scottish Government prior to the, the First Minister making her announcement on, on Monday? Uh, because the, the Government had a, quite a strong stance. Uh, the stance that's now being perceived, it's being portrayed, is that there's a softening of that stance because they're now having this consultation. Do you think that is the case? Uh, and as I say, and what kind of consultation have you had prior to the announcement on Monday? Well, as I said earlier, um, when the um, statement was uh, produced by COSLA, we convened as a, a member council um, and we made our position felt that rather than bury our head in the ground mm -hmm. and say no, um, that we, we invited, for the reasons as been outlined by Willie earlier, the government to now lead this, because I, we, it is not a, a local issue. It is a national issue. It's a global issue. It's conversation that is being had everywhere. So uh, we've, we've been very um, appreciative of the stance the government has taken up to now, and uh, I think that stance is absolutely correct. 
um, that you know it's not the time to consider such a, a levy uh, being imposed anywhere. But uh, there has to be, or without the full consultation and the under and the engagement of the industry in this co in this conversation, and up until well, in fact, we have had no direct communication or consultation with Edinburgh City Council, for example. I, they have never approached the Scottish Tourism Alliance once, uh, and the COSLA engagement at the early stages was was virtually nothing. So um, we have we met with uh, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, and the finance secretary, I think, it, towards the end of June, uh, after we've published our um, our response, uh, and again we had another meeting with them back in September, and have again, you know, requested that and recommended that the government take the lead and actually conduct uh, a, a government-led uh, consultation conversation with the informed uh, those invited into that conversation with in information that is transparent and clear for all to see and understand, but not just to um, consider the tra you know, a, a visitor levy as the, or TVL as the option, is to look to explore other, op other options as well in that discussion. So um, clearly with our conference having upwards of nearly 400 of the industry present, it was obviously a, an appropriate moment for the First Minister to, to make that announcement, which we welcomed. And, and as I said, her, her announcement has been perceived in the community as softening. Uh, do, you, do you believe that will be the case? Do you think that going out, you, you've got your uh, reports and you've got your statistics. Uh, the, the council in Edinburgh and Aberdeen and Highlands came back very strongly what their views were. Uh, uh, do you think that by going out for having this consultation, you're going to win the argument? I, I would like to think that um, it's not a softening. I think it's, um, you know, we in, in other issues that we've, we've brought forward evidence to the government and presented it in a very articulate way on a very factual basis, it's been listened to and it's been considered and I would very much hope that the, uh, I suppose, the commitment to doing and taking the lead as they have said, the government have said they would in this process is one that is uh, not a done deal uh, in any way, shape or form uh, and that all of the evidence and the research will be looked at in a responsible way and protect what is, you know, one of Scotland's biggest economies, uh, dr economic drivers. You know, we employ 220 odd thousand mm -hmm. Uh, people, the food and drink sector is affected. There's an enormous supply chain that sits behind us as well, and you know the switch off or risk to any business um, seeing a decline in visitor numbers. Two pounds may not be a lot for some, um, but when you multiply it and the looking beyond the current exchange rates as well, that all has to be done. So it mustn't be a hasty decision. It must be looked at in very in, in and, and, and I think it needs to be measured and it needs to be examined. Uh, and I think yeah. that what we're going to have is, is definitely that. Uh, but it, it's imperative that we get all sides of the story in this process. Yeah. Uh, and, and other countries and other parts of the world and other cities around Europe, etc., have found this to be quite successful. In a very different, in a very different um, yeah, and tax I, environment. And, and, I, I, and I think that is something that needs yeah. to be brought into this whole process, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that it's not like for like. No, uh, exa uh, exactly. And I just go back to, sorry, um, to the... the well, a number of members that want to ask questions, so I'm going to move on uh, to Mr Gibson. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Convener. I'm struck by some of the evidence you've presented. For example, both the ASC and UK Hospitality have stated that the World Economic Forum ranked the UK's already 135 at 136 in terms of tourism price competitiveness and that the UK uh, has the second highest VAT uh, in Europe at 20 percent um, and that the UK is one of the few EU countries that doesn't have a reduced rate of VAT for tourism and services and I think it's an iron rule of economics and of course my degree is economics that when prices go up uh, sales go down and you further talk about um, researchers at Nottingham University talking about the impact on visitors from the UK, Italy and Spain of a reduction of 1 percent, an increase of 1 percent of tax having a, a reduction of 2.2, 1.75 1.8 percent respectively. But my question to you is that Councillor McVeigh has said that some elements of your sector are in fact in favour of this tax. He quoted Airbnb and he said, and, and I quote, and I just want you to comment on this, although some industry bodies are keen to play up a consensus that doesn't exist, there is not a consensus in industry. Their industry voices is split. It might be one in four, 50-50, two, two thirds or a third that understand the impact the levy could make in supporting the sector. And industry voices understand the long-term concern that the levy is needed uh, if they're to uh, sustain the level of success. I just wonder if you can uh, comment 
on that. And, and Mr Irvin specifically, because I realise we're short of time, um, I'm just wondering if your view of, of, of the issue in, in relation to excessive numbers of visitors uh, coming to Edinburgh and going to Sky is a, a pricing policy that would uh, reduce access to Edinburgh and Sky for overnight visitors for people who are perhaps um, uh, um, not so well healed as others? Well, on, on that point, I think we should uh, all remember, I'm sure you're aware, that nowadays we can't walk into, we can't phone up a hotel and say, how much is a room in May? Because every night it's a different price. It's all dynamic pricing. And it's, it, it, you know, it's some of the prices that you pay for rooms in, in, in hotels in Edinburgh and Sky particularly, but elsewhere in North goes 500, enormously successful. There's very, you know, small amount of accommodation available. Um, prices are exceedingly high, so high that I, should, I, should, I expect that Scottish people can't sort of staycation uh, easily in Sky at all. I know lots of people that don't go to Sky anymore because they can't afford it and they don't want to take a camper van or they haven't got one because that makes has its own negative impact. So I, 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 I think that the idea of £2 a head, with lots of exceptions, um, with the revenue well spent, would not, I, you know, I, I don't really buy this, but this idea that if you, if you put prices up by 1%, then, then, then something else, you know, the, 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 the income goes down by 2% or whatever. Because you just need to see how many new hotels there have been in Edinburgh, and like, there seems to be like one a month. These are big players, they're international players in the main. These rooms are two, 300, 400 pounds a night. This is not, I, I, I looked yesterday what hotels are costing in October, even in Sky. Sky used to, the argument was always Sky, for example, it's seasonal. So, you know, um, but the season is now extended. Whereas in large parts of Scotland, including, I think, Glasgow, there isn't that demand. There isn't, there, there aren't really expensive rooms. Dynamic pricing is, 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 is a much more moderated kind of affair. Once again, I would just say I think Edinburgh is a real exception, and I, I, I can't see the effect. And actually, if it was going to put people off, then people might go outside of Edinburgh and stay, which would have a, a positive effect on its hinterland and Perthshire, for example. But um, the, 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 I think all uh, indications are that tourism, this is not a tap that's going to go off or get turned down. It's going to increase. Edinburgh will increase. And I would just say on behalf of the council, and God, I fought with the council long enough over the years. But, you know, Edinburgh is building an arts centre, uh, sorry, a new concert hall. Um, it's building um, the, the centre of the moving image, the film festival new venue, which is still years off, but there, there should be one and there will be one. Um, a, a, an open air, a world class amphitheatre in, in Prince Street Gardens. Leith Theatre, which would transform Leith in many ways, culturally, certainly. These things are paid for by the council and by by taxpayers who live here, and these are these would be they would increase the tourist and cultural offering of Edinburgh because we're a cultural city. That's why people come in the main because of the atmosphere and its history and etc. So, um, Fiona, um, I can't speak on behalf of Airbnb, but I don't believe they've actually issued any kind of statement supporting a TVL or tourist tax. What I do understand is that they can support it technologically. They do it in any number of other destinations. So it's fairly simple for them administratively to flick the switch and allow a TVL to be added to their, um, their income and their um, administration. However, that's not the case for the majority of short-term rental or self-catering properties in Scotland. So there is, there's a huge piece that needs to be looked at in terms of administration of such a tax. Thank you. Do you, Mr MacLeod? Could I just add an issue really in relation to, to Pete's comments on hotel rates? I, I think it's important over the piece uh, to look at the, the, the hotel industry. Yes, I agree entirely about dynamic pricing, uh, but the hotel industry, one of the most important metrics uh, looking at performance is the average daily rate achieved. And in Scotland, over the piece, the average daily rate achieved in all hotels in Scotland mm -hmm. is somewhere in the region of 70, 75, 78 pounds 
uh, per day. And yes, we see extremes of pricing. Um, we see high rates at peak times. We see lower rates at off-peak times. That is simple economics. It's supply and demand, and it's exactly the same if you go to buy a holiday, you go, with, go to buy an airline ticket, uh, supply and demand rules. And I, I think we've got to look at um, things like the, the, the overall tax burden borne by our visitors. Yes, we, we have made... Uh, the case. Uh, we've consistently made the case. And in fact, uh, to, to respond a little bit to Mr Stewart's question, this isn't the first Scottish government we've made the case to about a tourist tax. Uh, this, this issue goes way back to about 2007, 2008. And when I first came into the job I'm in now in 2011, it was the first meeting I went to with the City of Edinburgh Council, as then was, uh, to discuss tourist tax. We have consistently been making the point that we believe this is an uncompetitive approach given uh, our rate of VAT compared to the rate of VAT in our competitors. And I think the paper from COSLA in your bundle uh, eloquently makes the case that the, the cities and countries where they've looked at tourist taxes being in place are those with a much reduced rate of VAT on ours. People are building hotels in Edinburgh. People are building hotels in historic buildings. They're, 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 they're bringing life back into the city centre. Hotels built in a location like this are not cheap to build. Investors have to get a return on them. And they're not cheap to run. Um, one of the, the single highest um, uh, overheads we have is non-domestic rates, which run at 5 6 7% of turnover. Uh, and to suggest that uh, it is only local taxpayers who are paying uh, for some of the infrastructure is wrong. I mean, what, what is happening to the money that is coming into uh, the, the bundle of money uh, collected by non-domestic rate payers? And where is that going? Where are these businesses getting the return for their investment? I mean, if we had any other successful industry in Scotland, uh, we have a very successful tourism industry, are we seriously suggesting that in addition to taxes like uh, air passenger duty and VAT, that we would start taxing the customers of other successful industries. I venture to suggest we wouldn't. Okay. Thank you very much. You. Thank you, Ross Greer. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, there are three layers to this debate, and, and we've often got them a little bit blurred. There is the argument in principle of is this a power that councils should have the option uh, whether or not to exercise? There's then the debate of should they exercise it and how would they do that? And the third stage of it is what would they spend the revenue on coming from it? But to go to the start of this debate, um, Pete's very eloquently made the point around the unique situation that different areas of the, the country are in. Given that, given the unique state of local economies, the fact that councils are local elected bodies who know far more about what's in the best interest of their area than we do as a, a national parliament, is this not a power that they should have the option of using? And this debate can take place in 32 local contexts where the sector in that area, the community in that area, their elected representatives can decide what's best for them. I think, I think that... It certainly should be discussed in local areas as well as on a national level, but it has to be absolutely made clear that those local authorities ensure that there's an economic impact assessment, robust, independent, data-driven. Otherwise, it could go horribly wrong. And City of Edinburgh Council, despite their um, suggestions that they are consulting with industry, I don't believe they have done on, on a... On a required level. I invited myself to a meeting that I wasn't invited to, um, and it wasn't a consultation. It was them presenting what a fait accompli, what they intend to do. And then there was another meeting to discuss the administration of a tourist tax. Um, and again, they had basically made up their minds. So I feel like unless there's a, a, a really robust consultation on a national level, then we might make horrible decisions on a local level. But let's, just to, to clarify that, that, that's useful, but what you're not saying is that there's an objection in principle to councils having this as a potential tool at their disposal, but the process needs to be robust, it needs to be evidence-led, it needs to be consultative. Absolutely, and if the, if the evidence is that it's a good idea, then we have no objection to it. But I think in the current tax environment, it really has to be looked at very, very closely. Thank you. We have to be very careful that we don't end up with 32 <coughs> different solutions to a problem. Uh, that would be an, ad an administrative nightmare for businesses that operate in different parts of, of Scotland. Um, Fiona's already alluded to 
uh, the, the cost that would be borne by businesses in setting up systems, training staff, uh, remitting uh, an additional tax to a different source, and then, of course, there's the cost of auditing all of this. So uh, introducing something like this is not going to be without a direct cash cost on businesses, as well as potentially an economic cost to the country. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. I, I would say, um, you know, it comes back to the sort of the three pound figure that was quoted by a councillor in Inverness. You know, the understanding of probably what the reality is and the facts and the basic ground rules and, and the information that's out there. At local level, I don't think it's, it is that understood. I mean, the, the survey that was conducted over the summer period suggests that they've, you know, surveyed visitors. Well, those people were in Edinburgh when they were coming to the festival, of course they're probably going to say yes, they would come here. They came to a great experience. It's about how do we look at the wider picture, and it is a national issue. It's not just Edinburgh wanting to consider this. And once it starts in one authority, you know, other authorities will be looking to do similar or explore similar things. So hence the reason why we have, as a, a member council, or our member council has very much um, asked and recommended that it becomes a national conversation in the first instance. It's led by government and it actually is a level playing field and it's inclusive. It's not saying the local authorities are pushed to one side, but everybody be, needs to be around the table together and understanding and reading and interpreting the same information that's produced to inform the outcomes. Um, and to go back to, I think it was uh, Willie made the, the point earlier of um, tourists do contribute to local government funding by contributing towards a business that in turn pays non domestic rates. Do you believe that the that indirect contribution that goes through a couple of steps makes it back to the council? Does that cover the, the cost to local services? I think none of us disagree the massive benefit that tourism has to local economies. What we're talking about is the impact it has on local services and the service provider. Do you believe that the, that indirect contribution made by tourists covers the cost of the increase in, in the need for refuse collection in the centre of Edinburgh in August, for example? Well, well customers are contributing to the, the viability of the business. The business uh, pays rates for a certain amount of service to come back. The business also pays to have its refuse taken away. Uh, so the direct contribution from the customer enables the business to pay an independent contractor to come and take away business refuse. But what we're talking about is the, the whole tourist experience. So yeah, while the tourist uses something and produces waste, produces litter in the business, that's true. But when they're out on the street in Edinburgh, they're using a public bin like everyone else, but there's increased demand on that. And the City of Edinburgh Council have already talked about the considerable increased cost to them, literally just on refuse collection during the festival period. Now, but, but, sorry. But, but, but that comes back to stripping away the layers of the different elements of the tourism market. Um, you, you have staying visitors, you have day, day visitors, you have people staying with friends and relatives. Um, Yes, indeed, everybody makes a demand on local services, but introducing a TVL or a tourist tax is putting a discriminatory tax on anyone who uses commercial accommodation. So where, where, where is the rest of the contribution coming from, uh, from those who are not enabling businesses uh, to meet their contribution of, of cost and, and contribution to local services? If uh, I, could just I, I think we have to look at cause and effect here. Mm, absolutely. Um, if I could make one specific follow-up point around Airbnb have already been mentioned that this quite substantially unregulated part of the market that a lot of in fact, yourselves have made robust arguments about in the past. Um, is a model around a tourism tax or transit visitor levy not an opportunity to ensure that those using Airbnb and the hosts are actually making a financial contribution that at the moment is not being made because they are in that unregulated part of the market? I don't think we've looked at options. I mean, we, we're jumping, we're assuming there's a problem here that needs to be addressed. To my mind, that's yet to be proven. But we, if we have the principle of, yes, we, we, we've got to resolve this issue and we need to raise more money to do it, or we need to redirect existing money to do it, there's been no examination of options. I mean, is, uh, I, mean I could come up with several different options. Uh, but, I mean, looking at hypothecation of business rates, from uh, the beginning of the next financial year, Scottish Government gets 50% of the VAT uh, raised in Scotland. Well, um, the accommodation sector in Scotland, according to the figures I've got in front of me, contributes £465 million a year in VAT. Now, surely some of that, and that's the accommodation sector alone, it's not the tourism sector entirely, surely some of that money can find its way back into uh, supporting local services. I think we've got to look um, freshly at how we do this, 
Um, the, there's a conversation going on over on this side about uh, the, the potential reduction or abolition of air passenger duty. Um, are we, you know, are we talking about uh, abolishing, potentially abolishing one tourist tax, which raises in excess of 200 million a year for the Scottish government, and replacing it with another tax, uh, which is, is going to need a whole new administrative infrastructure to introduce and collect? I mean, I think we've, th this is why we want. The, the national conversation, why we want some research, why we want examination of options. And yes, we may not win this at the end of the day, but uh, in response again to Mr Stewart, I don't think we've seen a, a softening of government stance. Maybe I'm naive, uh, maybe too old to be naive, I don't know. But uh, I, I believe what I'm told, and I think we've got the opportunity here uh, to have an open debate about something that is becoming increasingly intractable and is being conducted through the pages of the Edinburgh Evening News. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just really picking up a couple of points uh, discussed thus far. Um, so, you know, I was struck with the example that Mark gave about family in Inverness and all it would cost, and then I was struck by what Peter said, which was, well, actually, hang on a second, because in many uh, cities and countries that have a tourist tax, there are exemptions for children at different age thresholds. I, I actually just had a look online. So Spain seems to be 16, France seems to be 18, um, Austria seems to be 15, just to name but three, for example. So I think it is important, and picking up what Willie said, that we really get down to a, a factual debate here, that we talk about the way it is as it is. Uh, because we would have, if this were to come to pass, presumably, like these other countries have done, an option to configure a tourist tax in a way that is deemed by all concerned appropriate. But, but getting back to the fundamentals, I mean, I think, and I had said it in the last evidence session we had on this subject about three weeks ago, you know, I think a lot of assumptions are being made about consumer behaviour here, and that is why I would like to see more detailed analysis, up-to-date analysis, looking actually at the experience of some of these other cities and countries which have introduced a tax. Presumably, uh, the introduction of such a tax in some of these places was controversial at the time, uh, and they've had a lead-in time to examine what impact, if any, this has had on, on numbers, because that, I understand, is your concern and should be the concern of everybody that wants to see a thriving tourism sector in Scotland. So. That would be my ask. Now, for example, we had a, a letter from Adam McVeigh at the Edinburgh City Council to the Committee of 2 October 2018, um, where he says um, that, you know, once when you look at the issue of VAT, and fair enough, uh, you know, sadly we are subject to one of the highest VAT rates uh, in the whole of the EU, thanks to the UK government, but if you look at the fact that they have a reduced rate of VAT, he goes on to say that once you combine the TVL in that city and the VAT, then Edinburgh would remain competitive. So, again, I think it is really important that we have a, a, a factual analysis here to show what is actually happening in other places that have this. I mean, this is now the norm for individual tourists from Scotland going elsewhere, going in Scotland and further uh, afield, and for other Europeans in particular coming to Scotland or travelling elsewhere in Europe in particular. This is the norm now. You know, times have moved on. This is what many countries have done. So I think it'd be really important to have the debate rooted in facts and, uh, you know, in 2018, taking into account this international experience. And I'd, I'd welcome just a few initial thoughts on that. And what are your plans? And I ask the same of Edinburgh City. What are your plans to ensure that that research is, is there and available to inform this debate? I think what we also have to be very, very wary of, and again, the the indicators that are coming through from the industry at the moment around consumer behaviour, is our core market, 60% of our core market, are changing their spending patterns considerably because they are actually having to manage cost. And you know, they're moving much more into the camping, into the camper van market. They are bringing their own food and drink into hotels. They are actually cutting their holiday time short. So there is a squeeze, and there is, it's only going to get tighter. We're all, you know, we, whatever the news, everybody, we all watch it. We're all feeling it, that everybody's budgets are being you know, stretched a bit further. So, yes, it's, 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 we are used to paying levies going further afield, but in a very different tax regime as well. So we, we mustn't compare apples and pears, and I think we have to be kept quite careful with that. But I do think that, you know, the, the longer-term view of how much of uh, 
uh, where's, where's the tipping point for a, for a family to cho choose to go and spend and stay? And, you know, the, the spike in that day visit experience, and that comes back to the, the pressures on, the, on some of these destinations where you do get a volume of people coming in, an increased volume of people coming in where they would maybe not normally be there is because they're actually not holidaying elsewhere or spending a longer time. So there are a number of facts that have to be explored and seriously considered without jumping straight in. And as I say, you know, go back to the, the, the interviews of the 600 people in the summer, I don't think are a true reflection of the, of the wider considerations that we need to uh, take into account before reaching a decision um, of, of this magnitude. And Scotland can't afford to be in a, in a position where it's seen to be um, uncompetitive, um, but equally the word tax at the moment when we want to keep the door open and windows welcome is uh, again in the media and the way it's being played out I don't think it's doing us any favours either. I think if, if uh, I'm not quite sure what arithmetic uh, Mr McVeigh uses in his letter to, to suggest that the combination of tourist tax and uh, VAT in other countries would exceed our current 20% VAT. I think you've got to be very careful in applying that arithmetic. And a very quick perusal of the the uh, analysis of tourist taxes and comparative VAT rates, which is something I've done myself. Um, COSLA probably has a more up-to-date version in, in the paper in front of you. But I couldn't readily see last night, looking at these figures, how a combination of tourist tax or TVL in some of the comparator countries there, plus their much reduced rate of VAT, actually began to exceed our 20% rate of VAT. And certainly if you use the United States as an example, where in fact they have to, <clears throat> they're not obliged like we are to show their hotel rates inclusive of VAT and all other charges. When you go to the States, you have a whole range of taxes added on to the rate. The highest rate of combined tax I've seen from a report done by HVS Hospitality Valuation Services into taxation on the lodging industry comes in at 18.75%, which is still a smidgen below our 20% VAT. So I think we've got to be very careful, and I think we have to look very carefully when we're making these comparisons. The blunt comparison is we are not competitive in VAT terms, and most other countries that have a tourist tax have a reduced rate of VAT. We need to take a much more holistic view uh, of how we're taxing our visitors and our tourism businesses. I don't have all the figures, it's very difficult to get them, but in many European countries, the property tax or the equivalent of our non-domestic rates on hospitality businesses is much lower than the non-domestic rates our sector is paying here. Well, thank you very much, and, and uh, I, I, I hear what you say. Uh, I, I, I do feel, though, that the, the and I hope that this uh, industry consultation gives the opportunity for these issues to be indeed fleshed out in hard facts, because that would allow all of us to have the best uh, debate possible on this very, very important issue. So I hope that that's a point that is reflected on by your organisations, because that would be a really helpful. Uh, uh, contribution to the debate to ensure that we we can take decisions based on the best evidence available. Okay, thanks very much. That wasn't a question, so I shall move it swiftly on to Stuart McMillan. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, just for the uh, for the record, uh, I also met with Fiona Campbell during the summer as I chair the cross party group on tourism and also recreational boating and marine tourism. Uh, so I do regularly meet with Mark and uh, Willie as well. Um, just on the issue of the taxation. Um, uh, and the issue of VAT. I mean, has any of the panel undertaken any activity just regarding the, the, the wider basket of taxation, including corporation tax, to actually help inform this debate? We've, <coughs> as I alluded to earlier, and as I, I've got in uh, the paper I submitted, we looked at the, uh, we took a top line look at the contribution uh, through various taxes made by the accommodation industry in Scotland. And I think we're showing a figure, of, if I remember correctly, 719 million uh, is the contribution. I appreciate some of that uh, finds its way to Westminster, uh, but one can only assume that some of that finds its way back in terms of the block grant. Um, so the, the figure is there in terms of the the, the tax take coming from published sources. That excludes things like contributions by uh, tourism business to business improvement districts, uh, and it probably includes, uh, excludes a very significant contribution indirectly by our customers through excise duty, 
on uh, road fuel that they use when they're here and on alcoholic drinks they buy from our businesses. That tax is collected indirectly. Uh, certainly the, the STA uh, have um, campaigned for quite some time on the issue of uh, VAT uh, and uh, the high level of VAT. Uh, clearly also that's set at UK level. Um, have you, has STA had any indication at all from the UK government that the VAT level will be reduced or amended uh, going forward? Well, I, what I would say is that um, the Cut Tourism VAT campaign is actually being led by um, down south, um, and it's been fun led by UK by UK hospitality, and uh, the STA are, are absolute supporters of that. Uh, so um, we're aware that um, conversations um, have been uh, ongoing across uh, the devolved states with the with the cabinet secretaries, respective cabinet secretaries. There is obviously um, the Northern Ireland issue at the moment, where um, there is a challenge uh, and around tourism VAT, which is being considered, and that potentially then could open up, pending the outcome of what that decision is, to a, a challenge for VAT to be reduced into Scotland as well. But at the moment, the, uh, there's been a varied uh, mixture of support within um, Westminster. I think at one point we had about 135 uh, MPs in favour of uh, certainly uh, a lowering of VAT, but it's uh, with all the changes that are happening and continue to happen, um, that argument probably isn't as robust as it could be. Um, but I think, you know, as we, we've said before, um, you know, the VAT reduction for our sector is, is arguably the game changer for us. We've seen evidence in Northern Ireland where, you know, the uh, government took the decision to reduce their VAT state down from 13% to 9%. They remo removed their passenger duty. And this... Sorry, sorry, Republic, Republic of Ireland, correct. Thank you, Willie, for correcting me. Um, and actually the growth um, that the revenues, of receipts have, have driven through tourism growth and employment has been significant. So uh, I think there's a good case study there to follow. And, you know, VAT then, a lowering of VAT, then there becomes a very different conversation around a tourism levy. Um, and one, one would say that uh, that's where we would like to get to and we would rather have more people focusing on getting a VAT reduction and considering that as the primary opportunity rather than actually looking into a window of a, a tourist tax on top of what is already a high, the second highest level of VAT in Europe. Okay. Uh, There's a very sound economic argument, we think, using the Treasury's own model, uh, which supports uh, the economic case for reducing tourism VAT. And I'd happily share a fact sheet with the committee on that. I th think that would be very helpful. Uh, and just uh, one final question, because also I'm conscious of time. Uh, if at the end of uh, this consultation, this national conversation that's taking place, uh, if a decision was taken to implement any type of TVL, uh, would the panellists uh, want it to be done on a national perspective or for it to be done from a, a local regional perspective across the 32? And is an if. Based on the comment I made earlier about not wanting to have 32 different systems in place, uh, I think uh, our preference would be for it to be national. And uh, if there were clear rules and the, if such attacks were uh, present, and I appreciate it's a hypothetical question, so I'll give you a hypothetical answer, <laughs> um, I, I think we'd prefer to see it at national level with clear rules about how it would be administered so it was common throughout the country. I think that would uh, certainly very much diminish the Edinburgh view if it was around the country. Personally, I don't think it would be at all welcome around most of the country. Um, I just reiterate again that Edinburgh is a very, very particular, exceptional situation. And tourism is increasingly experiential. That's what it is. People come to Edinburgh because of the experience. And... Um, uh, the, but there's also the experience of the people that live here, and that's that is a balance that has to be made, and and that's where the discussion, it may be conducted within the pages of the evening news at the moment, but it should be, it should be a, obviously a much wider discussion, and um, it, it it's very difficult for people to know what it's really like being a tourist when you live here, or what it's going to be like in the future, mm. <clears throat> but the future. The future does look pretty good, for, particularly for Edinburgh, 
and Edinburgh is the gateway to Scotland. And um, you know, increasing flights, increasing cultural experiences that, that I talked about uh, a moment ago. Um, more, I think more and more people will, will come to Edinburgh. Hotels will be more full. The season will be longer. And th th this should really be considered as to how it... I mean, it's very much part of the VAT picture. But I always think of uh, Edinburgh a bit like Dublin. Dublin is always expensive to stay in a hotel. Um, and perhaps they don't have enough hotels, but people go to Dublin for the experience too. And, and I, I can't remember what the VAT regime there is either. But Edinburgh has to consider itself in an international context, I think is what I'm saying, like Barcelona, like Venice, like Rome, wherever there are increasing numbers of tourists coming in and in the city centres, in the old towns of city centres in, in all these cases. And, uh, I, it, you know, it, it would, if, if there's a way that's worked out fairly, so that the money that's gathered, the revenues are apportioned to benefit the experience of tourists and locals in this city, I mean, I don't know about Aberdeen, to be honest, um, or even Glasgow, but in this city, I think it should be properly consulted with everyone. Thank you very much. Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you. Can I assure Mr Evan that it's been mentioned in the Shetland Times as well. It's not just the Edinburgh <laughs> Evening News, uh, and they're not in favour of it. And I think, I th no, and, uh, and you've made the point. I think I actually take uh, William McLeod's point, but I actually think if it was imposed on a, a local level, quite a lot of areas of Scotland just wouldn't impose it. Uh, so I, 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 I take your eye. Um, can I just, ch ch I mean, I, uh, Mr Evans made, a, uh, made an earlier remark about what the money would actually be spent on. I actually think that's quite important. Um, is the concern of the three of us, three panellists here today who are not in favour of that, or not persuaded, shall we be more gentle on our language, not persuaded of the merits of a, of a tourist tax. Is your concern that the money that was raised by that would just disappear into the general local government pot, be spent on schools and everything else, and it actually wouldn't be spent on uh, services that are directly attributable to the tourism product, whether being in Edinburgh or anywhere else? That would be one concern. Um, I'll answer that part first and then defer to my colleagues. Um, I, I think, um, and therefore, it's a way around well, that criteria. <clears throat> if, the, if, if there was a policy of uh, a tourist tax, and you have to remember, there's a budget coming up in this place on the 12th of December. So very acutely you're not, aware of that, you're not yes. my name, Mr. McLeod. Um, uh, the uh, if it is imposed, is, would it not be better to have criteria set which said that mo that money is raised if there is such a levy in such an area, such as Edinburgh, needs to be spent on the tourism product in Edinburgh? I think if. Uh, there was such a tax, uh, then yes, yeah. um, ring-fenced for tourism, with um, considerable input from the industry itself yeah. about how that how that was spent. Um, if I may, just responding to, to Pete, the, the VAT rate in, on a hotel room in Dublin is 9%, and in Dublin there is no tourist tax. And yet the rooms are still incredibly expensive yeah. because of the demand. Yeah. Because running hotels is quite expensive. Among, you know, <laughs> But I, I would, uh, in, in, uh, yes, you know, I think absolutely categorically there would need to be some very, very um, strong sort of guidelines that that money is protected to uh, and only used for tourism enhancement, you know, and actually making sure that the quality of the tourism experience is, is extended and it's used to promote. I think Willie referred to earlier around the contributions the industry already make in other ways to bids as well. Um, you can't underestimate the amount of money that businesses actually make in marketing Scotland, whether it be their own destination or their own premises, and actually also considerably contribute um, to some of the, um, the, the local marketing activity at destination level as well. So, um, you know, clearly we want to make things, uh, every, every business would want to make the, themselves the best they can be. So. Um, when you read a headline, as it was again a few weeks ago, the teachers' union met in Dundee, and I think the headline was great, Edinburgh tourist tax will pick up the shortfall of the teaching budget in Edinburgh. You know, uh, that sort of sends alarm bells to industry, as you would imagine it. So, okay. Have you finished, yeah, Mr Scott? Yes, OK. I'd, I'd just like to finish up... Um, uh, Going back to our panel previously, um, we talked about how um, you know the impact on infrastructure wasn't just caused by overnight visitors, it was caused by day visitors as well, and we've touched on that here too. Um, last time we talked about um, ocean liner 
passengers coming into ports like uh, Inverclyde that Mr McMillan represents and we had quite a long discussion about um, the camper van issue in the Highlands and the amount of um, you know pressure that puts on the roads, toilets, that kind of thing. Are the panel aware of any international examples of tourist taxes that successfully capture all visitors, that's day visitors and overnight visitors? No. I'm not personally aware of any, unless you were to look at some form of property-based tax that applied to every business that in some way benefited from the, the visitor economy, which would probably spread the load uh, much more equitably. Right. I, yeah, I'd say, say no on that. But I, I would just like to draw, again, the attention, I think, which is really important in the future research as well, or the research that gets done. Um, we had one of our presentations at the conference on... Um, on Monday from Euromonitor, and it's looking at the future trends and travel trends of tourism. It is experiential now, of going increasingly more so, as, as Pete alluded to, hence the Airbnb culture that's been adopted. The camper van market is actually one that people like to increase. So we mustn't penalise, I think, look to penalise what is a changing behaviour of a traveller. And actually cities will become, you know, the destinations of the future. And there is a lot of really, really good intelligence and insights out there that we have to be looking further, of, further ahead in this conversation rather than it just being a knee-jerk reaction to what is um, a short-term or considered to be short-term solution. Um, and as we are very, very unclear about what might happen in the next, you know, we while, um, we, we shouldn't be uh, putting any barriers in the way to prevent what is a very, a very successful industry and contributes a huge amount of value to the economy in, in other ways as well. I mean, just a point on the Airbnb market, which is a serious concern uh, in this city. Um, I'm, maybe I'm not entirely sure about this, but I don't think that most Airbnb revenues have any VAT added to them, so they're not paying any VAT already. And, um, and if Airbnb were minded and could certainly more easily administer it than some organisations, um, then perhaps, you know, they, they would, that would be a substantial contribution. And Airbnb is something that seriously does affect people that live here. Thank you very much to all our witnesses uh, for coming along today to give evidence and uh, we are now going to go into private session. Thank you very much.